be to God. You may be seated. Narrow is the path that leads to salvation. Broad is the path that leads to destruction. That is what we heard Jesus say last week. We looked exactly what that meant. What does it mean to be narrow? To be narrowly focused on following in the footsteps of our Lord Jesus. And, and to reject the broad, easy approach of having a few things to hold on to and, and oversimplifying life. Right? The challenge to get our minds around then is how do we discern how narrow or broad to be in any situation, right? The, Jesus warns in Matthew 15, 6, we should not make void the word of God for the sake of human tradition, which would be getting so wrapped up in what's in front of us that we lose track of that we're trying to follow Jesus. We just get wrapped up in what's in front of us. Or the other extreme, which is to to just try to make things too simple, right? To end up condemning the guiltless, Matthew 12, 7. Jesus warns us against by trying to make things too easy. Right? So there's a need to figure out how to approach specific situation. How do we figure out how to handle new challenges and questions as they arise? And the Bible lays out for us, in the Gospel of Matthew is where it happens, Jesus lays out for us an approach to handling new challenges and questions and situations. And he talks, Jesus talks about it uh, two times and then practices it often. And he talks, always talks about it in the context of church. He talks about binding and loosing. And as soon as he says binding and loosing, the next sentence is church. In, in Matthew uh, 16, he says to Simon Peter, who has just accurately confessed who, who Jesus is, uh, he says, you know what, uh, you're going to be the church, the key to the church, and as the church, what you're going to do is to bind and to loose. Whatever you bind in heaven is bound, bound on earth is bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth is loosed in heaven. Right? And so that is the very nature. If you are a church, you are going to bind and loose. And then a few chapters later, we read uh, Jesus talking again to the disciples about how to handle conflict. And he says, to the, he gives them this process. You go and you, you talk to the person individually, and you go get help. And, and then if that doesn't work, you bring it to the church. And what's the church do? The church binds or looses. What's, what's the situation there? The very nature of church is that you're going to bind and to loose. So binding and loosing is this process of discernment. It's this process of deciding when any particular law should be bound to that situation or loosed. Does it apply or not in a more modern parlance, right? And so we see examples of this. The Jewish rabbis would figure out, uh, how do you apply a law? Thou shalt not steal. Okay, great law. We all agree. Don't steal? Good. You're walking down the road, and you find a baby chicken. A little baby chicken there. If you pick it up and put it in your pocket, or just put it in your bag and walk off, you've stolen, right? Do you, but do you need to like search the entire town to find out where it came from? No. How hard do you have to search if you find a baby chicken? The rabbis tell us, 75 feet. That's about how far you could expect a chicken to go. Right? If you check 75 feet, can I look around? Uh, you don't, you, uh, and then you take, you haven't stolen if you check within 75 feet. Right? And, and so it depends upon the situation, right? When we do that as well, we, if you find a dollar bill, how hard do you try to find the owner of a dollar bill you found on the ground? Hey, anyone lose a buck? Uh, and then you put it in your pocket and don't feel bad about it. If you find my wallet, how hard do you find? If you find, hey, this is Andy Kuhn's wallet. It's got 80 bucks in it. I don't see Andy. Put the 80 bucks in it and walk away. No, I'd expect a little bit more effort out of it, right? And actually, I can't find my wallet right now. So if you do find my wallet, this is in all seriousness. <laughs> Somewhere in my travels yesterday, my wallet went poof. And so if you find my wallet, keep the 80 bucks. I just need my wallet. <laughs> But this practice of binding and loosing, it's essential because we've got to figure out how to apply the law. It's not that we follow the law or not. It's how, do you, it's how do you apply it in specific situations. Where is it bound to that one but loosed in, in the others? And the rabbis, they figured, they, and we see just wonderful examples of this. Uh, don't work on the Sabbath, right? That's the law, Ten Commandments. Honor the Sabbath, keep it holy, don't work. How do you know if you're working? The rabbis said for centuries, here's how you know if you're working. Are you sweating? If you're sweating, you're working, so stop it. Right? And then a new situation came up. The Romans came through and they installed the Roman baths, these heated like sauna type baths. If you go to one, you're sweating. So if you go to a sauna on the Sabbath, 
and you're sweating, are you breaking the law? No, they decided. They, they loosed the law right there. It, it, this is not binding, it is loosed. You, you can go and you're not breaking the Sabbath if you're sweating in, in a sauna. Right? And, and so there's this process uh, of discernment, of, of figuring out, is this situation necessary? And, and Jesus does this as well. Uh, it's in Numbers 30, it says, if you swear an oath, keep it. And Jesus takes that, that law and says, this is not just binding upon when you explicitly say, I, Andy, formally swear. It applies every time you open your mouth. If you open your mouth, that is, it, this is binding. Your, let your yes be yes and let your no be no. That's what Jesus has to say about that. Jesus applies, um, love your neighbor, right? Leviticus 19, 18, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. What if your neighbor's not being very neighborly and, and absconding and running off with all your little baby chickens, right? Do you still have to love your neighbor if your neighbor's running off with your chickens? Jesus says yes. He binds that law upon that situation. Even if your neighbor is being a jerk, you still got to love that beloved child of God who's taken off with your chickens, right? Honor the Sabbath and, and keep it holy. Like, what, can I heal someone on the Sabbath? Yes, you can. Jesus says that is not, it's not binding right there. You can always work to heal someone on the Sabbath. That it doesn't apply, right? <clears throat> and, and then Jesus goes through it and again and again, can I pay taxes with coins that are idolatrous because they say Caesar is God? Yes, give to Caesar what is Caesar's. That's not idolatry. That's the law against idolatry doesn't apply there. It is loosed. And, and if you lust after, someone, lust after someone in your mind, that the law and adultery is binding there. I mean, he just goes through again and again and binds and looses specific laws. And then he goes through and gives the principles by which we do these, right? Love your neighbor as yourself. Right? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, strength, and soul. Do other, unto others as you would have them do unto you. I desire mercy over sacrifice. The weightier matters of the law are justice, mercy, and faith. These are the principles that Jesus uses to, to guide how he's, he goes through. Okay, this applies here. That doesn't apply there. Right? And then he goes and he critiques the Pharisees for messing this up. Because the specific thing that he accuses the Pharisees of is he says, you bind on people heavy loads. And you hear that verb, right? Bind. What the Pharisees, he's telling the Pharisees they're doing is that he's, they are making people's lives too hard because he's, they're using the laws of God and it's saying that they have to apply them in here, 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 here every, everywhere, and he's making it too hard. And Jesus says, but my yoke is light, right? I'm not going to load you down with all these laws that are persnickety, and you're not going to have to count up your dill and, and tithe ten leaves out of a hundred of your dill, right? That dill really doesn't leave basil, whatever. You get the point. And so he goes through and he critiques the Pharisees for doing that. And having practiced it and taught it and critiqued others in doing it, now he goes to Simon Peter and all the disciples and say, now it's your turn. I empower you to do this. This is going to be your gig. You as the church, Peter probably doesn't know what the church is. Peter, you as the church, this is your gig. You're going to be the people who bind and loose. And what you decide as the church is going to be bound and loosed in heaven. And then Jesus gives further uh, guidance on it. Because he says, whatever you bind and loose in the middle of conflict. right? Because the way you are going to figure out how to bind and to loose is when, when you get sideways with someone in the church and it becomes such an issue that the whole church has to be in, involved, that's when you're binding and loosing. As the church, you are deciding whether a law applies or not. Wherever two or more are gathered, there I am, and as we are gathered in the name of Christ, with Christ there, we're going to bind and loose and decide. And now we have been doing binding and loosing for decades, centuries. We don't call it that. But like, who here is wearing clothing made of two types of material? Right? Who, really, who, who's here, right? You are breaking the law, right? You are breaking the law. The Old Testament law is you shall not wear clothing made of two types of materials, period. Right? It's in there. You can check, right? We look at that law, and, and we, we think that the concern in, in Old Testament times is either that wearing clothing made of two types of material is a kind of a decorative thing that might be a sign uh, of worship of false gods. I, I don't think you're devil worshippers because you wear polypropylene mixes or whatever you're wearing, right? Or the other concern might be practical, that you think the clothing will fall apart because you couldn't make clothing out of two types of material that were going to stand up. I doubt your shirts are going to dissolve before the end of service. 
worse. Right? So we loose that law. Right? We say that law does not apply. It's not that that law isn't true, it just doesn't apply here in this context. So go ahead and buy as much whatever rayon mixes you want. Right? We do this with murder, right? Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not murder, when the big Ten Commandments, right? Does that apply to someone who's in the military? Is it bound there or is it loosed? We argue about that. But that's the type of discussion we do. We, but we, we have to argue and discern as a church, is it bound or loose? Thou shalt not murder when you are in the military. I could give you examples like that all day long, but you see what we're doing, right? The church is always going to be trying to figure out whether a particular new situation should be covered by this scripture or that. Because scripture is always true. It's just what parts apply where. Now, what happens when a new situation occurs and the church just has to decide whether to bind a loose on the law on a certain situation is we're going to agree with it or not. I have here the stand, the, this book of discipline. This is the, the opinion of the Methodist Church. And I'm going to promise you something, two things. I'm going to promise you two things about this. You're never going to read it because it is dry. And you disagree with parts of it. I know you disagree with parts on it, because between this and the book of resolutions, the addendum that's like that thick, there are opinions on everything from unions to charter schools to genetic research to, I mean, you pick an issue and there's an opinion in there about it, and you disagree with some of them. That doesn't make you bad Methodists or bad Christians. What that means is you are part of a church that is con constantly trying to figure out how to bind and to loose. You're part of a, dis a discussion. Just like the binding and loosing discussion was happening centuries ago. Every time I do research into the Old Testament law of the first centuries, I find there are two rabbis that just argued for their entire lifetimes, Rabbi Shammai and Rabbi Hillel. And they never said the other one wasn't a Jew. They just argued for an entire lifetime with each other about how to be a Jew, whether this law should apply and be bound here or loosed there. And then their disciples kept the argument up. And so they just have like generations of arguments. Right? And that's what we're part of, a generational argument about how to follow Jesus, how to bind and to loose. And so what happens as part of this generational discussion long-standing discussion is either we say that we will be we will follow this even with we disagree with it or we say that we're going to do what we, what you might call prophetic disobedience and say that this is so wrong that we're going to take a stand and I'm going to do something else because this is what I believe is, is the truth of God. Now, my vow as a Methodist pastor is that I'm bound to follow this, and I, I do, right? I don't agree with it all, but I, I do follow it all, right? And, and that's actually part of the vows of membership. You vow to uphold the work of the church. You didn't agree to it all. You just agreed to uphold, right? There's, there's an important nuance there. <coughs> and so that, that's how we, where we stand with binding and loosing today. And where we will always stand with binding and loosing, it is the process by which we as a church are empowered by Jesus to work through what law applies in which situations. Now, why is Andy talking about this today? Huh. I've been sitting on this sermon for two years now. It's not exactly the most easy to explain concept, admittedly. I've been sitting on it be until about two months ago. I thought it was time to get this out because we needed to discuss something that is happening. Over the last two months, annual conferences across the country have, through a pro this type of process, binding and loosing, have passed, uh, there are four of them, have passed acts of nonconformity where they have said that they will not be bound by the Book of Discipline statement on homosexuality and they will begin ordaining gay and lesbian people as pastors. Prophetic disobedience is what they would see it as. It's the Desert Southwest Conference, the California Pacific Conference, Pacific Northwest, and New England. The boards of ordained ministry in the following conferences have said that they will not consider issues of sexuality and gender when they decide who is ordained. New England, Baltimore, Washington, New York, Northern Illinois, and the Pacific Northwest. There were three openly gay candidates for bishop. This, uh, we just elected bishops, right? One of them was elected out in California, Bishop Karen Elovetto. There's a church in Dallas, Texas, North Haven, UMC. 98% of the congregation just voted to begin performing garages, marriages between any two women or two men. So, 
the future of the Methodist Church right now is wrapped up in how do we as Christians go through this process of binding and loosing? How do we understand as a church and as annual conferences what we're going to do with those seven passages of scripture that have some applicability about how we receive the gift of sexuality? There are seven passages in scripture that have any reference to homosexuality. How do we take those passages and how do we bind and loose them in the church today? Right? I'm going to tell you what I think about it, but I'm not going to do it today. I'm sorry. I really am. If you look back, I've actually been preparing for this for weeks. You just didn't realize it. John Wesley, what did we argue about? That was getting here last week, narrowing what narrowing and broad, and this week, binding. I've, I've been preparing you all to be able to have this conversation, but I can't do it today because whew, service is just not long enough. I need two weeks to sit down and chew on it. I've been taught, when I was in, at Duke, um, I ran a two-year lecture series on how do we handle this question. There are faithful gay Christians in the church. And, and I brought in all professors at Duke and, and uh, anyone else I could find. And, and I, I've been chewing on this for 14 years now. And so next time I preach, I will have for you the summation of 14 years of my research and thought and discernment on how to bind and loose. Um, so, same bat time, same bat channel. But, uh, and, and admittedly, it's not going to be next week either because Angie Olson will be preaching. I'll be in Texas. Did I mention I need to find my wallet? I'm going to Texas on Friday. <laughs> uh, but when I, when I come back, I will be sharing with you what I think. Um, and, and I'll just warn you up front, I don't, there are like two sides to this. I don't fall on the side. The sides are too... Ugh. We, we, what, here is my hope and here is my commitment. I'm going to end today with how I'll begin next time I preach. My hope is that we find a way forward that is distinctly Christian, a way that is graceful and holy, a way that both accepts that everyone is a sinner and believes that everyone is called to be remade in the image of God. And I leave you also with my commitment. I'm here to serve as your pastor. Whether we agree about this or not, I'm your pastor. I'm here to serve you. For following Jesus together is more important than anything else. Amen. I've never done a too big.